Uh, welcome, viewers, to our continued uh, live broadcast of our sessions and lessons. Uh, my name is um, Mr. Oliver Anyanga, and uh, I will take you through an aspect of literature in English. Welcome. Now, in today's session, we are going to have a focus on A Doll's House. Uh, which is a text, a compulsory text in um, our literature. Of course, we are expected to be tested in paper three. Now, um, today we are looking at motives in a doll's house. So we begin by asking a very simple question here. Uh, what is a motive? Now, to take you through the definition of the word motive, uh, I will look at uh, various ways of actually defining it. Now, when you look at uh, the um, Oxford Learners Dictionaries, uh, a motive is defined as a subject, an idea, or a phrase that is repeated throughout a given text of literature. So very important there. That a motive or a motif is an idea, a phrase, or a subject that is repeated throughout a given text of literature. So we could also look at a different a definition of the same because that is a general way of looking at it. Now when we focus and look at it in terms of literature and for those who can go on and do their own research uh, you can look at um, uh, these two websites so we have literarydevices.com and another one study.com now it is defined in these two areas uh, where we have a discussion by different people as uh, basically an aspect of literature where we have events, we have contrasts, we have ideas, and even literary devices which are used recurrently in a text to the extent that they contribute to the way a writer passes his or her message across to the audience. And by the audience here, I mean the reader. So that tells you that a motive is a very important component of any literary discourse, of any literary uh, discussion for that matter. So we can just define it. I'll write it for you. For those who are following, you can uh, make notes here. So good. Uh, that is a very clear definition there. So we go on. Now, as we focus on a doll's house, uh, everyone understands, and of course at this point you've done or we've covered other aspects of a doll's house, uh, of course, uh, especially concerning themes. And now that you're looking at motifs, then it's important that we look at it uh, in relation to the themes. What themes have you covered so far? We have a number of important themes. Like, for instance, the sacrificial role of women. Uh, you've looked at the theme, uh, the theme of conflict. You've looked at the theme of marriage. And specifically, marriage as an, an equal partnership uh, in this text by Henrik Ibsen. So we have other themes that you've looked at, which I can't uh, mention because of our time here. So, 
In relation to those themes, what are some of the recurring structures in this text? So obviously, maybe um, because we are looking, I've looked at the definition of the word motif, which is in singular form. So obviously in plural form, motifs will mean recurrent use of ideas, contrast, etc. So it remains the same aspect there. So what are the motifs in a doll's house? There is a question that everyone should be asking himself or herself as we go on with this session. What are these aspects? What are these ideas? What are these contrasts that the writer in a doll's house keeps on referring back to? That is enough time for everyone to think about them, so I'll just highlight them, and then uh, during the lesson we will look at a number of them. So, number one, Okay, so those are the motifs that we have to put a lot of uh, interest uh, in. So one, we look at symbolism. Two, we look at the contrasting use of the word freedom. Three, we have the use of letters. Number four, we have irony, and specifically, we are interested in dramatic irony. So, of course, we understand we have different types of irony, like situational, verbal, and then obviously dramatic irony. And then lastly, there is foreshadowing. So, I'll begin by looking at symbolism as a motif in a doll's house. So what is symbolism? I'll not dwell on different definitions of the word symbolism, but I'll just give a general and the simplest view of the same. So the word symbolism refers to a style in, uh, in literature in which people, places, objects, events, and any other thing which is concrete is actually used to refer to an idea that is abstract. So let me just take you through that again. We have two ideas or two important aspects of symbolism that comes out in my definition. One, concrete, and then two, abstract. So it's quite clear, or let me just deconstruct what I mean with that.
okay? So that should be clear that when we talk about symbolism, first we have the idea of a symbol. So what is a symbol? A symbol is basically a sign. And where we have a sign, it means we have something concrete. Concrete means something that can be something tangible, something you can see, touch, feel, it is see. Uh, something that is concrete representing an idea which is obviously abstract. So for instance, when we look at a doll's house, we have a number of cases where symbolism is actually used there. We, we've already had a discussion on this, so I'm just going to uh, take you through this very fast uh, by just mentioning before I look at um, uh, the other aspects. So one, Just like I've mentioned, I'm not going to dwell so much on symbolism because we've already had a discussion on this. So I'll just take you through very fast. So when we talk about the Christmas tree, we can argue that the Christmas tree is used in a number of ways. One, it symbolizes the Christian religion and the festivities that come with the Christmas period. And then number two, from the writer's perspective, the Christmas tree can also be symbolic of Nora. Now, what is this Christmas tree? A Christmas tree is basically an object. An object that is used to decorate the house, the Helmer's house, during this period of Christmas. Now, the question someone is asking, how is it representing Nora? So the idea is simple, that Nora in a doll's house is just like a decoration in Helma's life. She is there just like an object. She is submissive. She is there to please Torvald. And the main aspect of her life revolves around the house, the children, and pleasing the husband. And that is why, obviously, Torvald refers to her with all those pet names. So you remember my Skylark and others that come with it. <clears throat> In addition to that, we can also look at the macarons. Now, of course, you remember that period when uh, Nora has just come back from shopping. Uh, she gets to the house and, of course, looks, uh, wants to find out if the husband is in his room. And then later on, takes a macaron, puts it in her mouth, and then when the husband is coming out, she wipes her mouth after putting back the packet of macarons in the pocket. Now, we understand one thing, that Torvald has forbidden the eating of macarons in his house, especially by Nora, because they are not good for the teeth. Nora so far appears very submissive, willing to do anything for the husband. But then why is she going against a rule that has been put there by the husband? And now that takes us to the symbolism here, that Nora is deviating from the norm. Nora is becoming rebellious towards the husband. So, 
The moment the husband comes and asks if she has been to the confectioners and she says no, she even goes further and says that she cannot think of going against the husband's wishes. We all know this is a lie. It's dramatic irony that we understand as the audience that she has partaken the macarons, but then she says she hasn't. She denies it. So we can argue that this incidence with the macarons is symbolic of Nora's rebellion towards the end of the text when she says she's not any more interested in being submissive to the husband and she wants to look at a different way of defining her life. Uh, we could also look at the tarantella as a symbolic presentation. Now, when you talk about the tarantella, obviously everyone remembers the dance that Nora is going to actually perform at the stain books. Now, we go slightly back to understand the origin of Tarantella. And it's worth noting that Tarantella actually comes from an Italian legend. So we understand what a legend is, oral literature aspect there, so we shouldn't take time on that. So it comes from an Italian legend uh, that talks about a type of spider known as a type of spider known as tarantula. Tarantula. Now, this, in this, according to the legends, if this spider beat an individual, then the poison would stay in that person's blood. And interestingly, the poison would only come out if this person engaged in a vigorous dance that entailed sweating. So you can imagine that. That someone is bitten by a spider, and the only way the poison can come out is when this person dances so vigorously that they sweat a lot and the poison comes out through the sweat. Does that ring a bell? Yes. In the preparation for the dance, Nora pretends that she's forgotten everything she knows about the dance. And she actually requests the husband, Helma, to help her as she practices. She dances so vigorously that even the husband notices that she's taking the dance so seriously. And then later on, when they go for the dance, and late subsequently after the dance, the husband comments that she performed the dance as if it was real. So now, where is the symbolism? The symbolism is this, that the dance that Tarantella is being used in a symbolic way to show the psychological trauma the psychological suffering that Nora is going through at this point. Now, what is the cause for this? The cause for her psychological trauma is obviously the deceit, the secret that she has kept from the husband, which now is to be revealed through the letter from Krogstad. 
So we can argue that on one hand, it represents the psychological suffering Nora is going through, while at the same time, it also represents the avenue through which Nora believes that she can get out the poison. In this case, I mean the suffering. The poison in her, the suffering in her, can come out if she dances so vigorously. She sweats. And obviously the poison comes out just as explained from the perspective of the Italian legend. I'll also briefly look at the dance costume. Uh, now, this actually happens the moment, or we come across it the moment both Helma and Nora have come back from uh, the neighbors, the Steinbogs place after the Tarantella. And uh, before Nora actually leaves, after that conflict that happens on Helma's learning of the secret and Nora's deceit. She actually removes the costume towards the end. She takes it off. So you can look at a situation where someone is putting on a given attire that is meant for performance. So when something is meant for performance, it means you're just putting it on for a specific purpose and for a specific period of time. So now she is in the dance costume. So the removal of the dance costume signifies the change in Nora's resolution. Nora, of course, wants a different life. She has realized this is not the man she wants to stay or to spend the rest of her life with. So in the end, she has to change and uh, go on, look at a different way of uh, doing or dealing with a life there. So I think those four, I believe those four, uh, having been explained, should be important. I'll just mention the other aspects of symbolism, which everyone can actually uh, explain. They are not as tough. So we could look at some characters being used in a symbolic way. Okay, so there we go. We can have Dr. Rank, we can have Helma, we can have Nora. So Dr. Rank can be used to symbolize the immoral nature of the society. Now, why am I saying that? When we meet Dr. Rank for the first time, he looks like the epitome of morality, and he condemns Krogstad for being very immoral. But then later on, in an ironical twist, we realize that Dr. Rank has been lasting for Nora, who is his best friend's wife. So it gives a question, or it puts a question mark on the idea of morality in this society, that even that person who looks so, um, I mean, someone who looks um, very respected, someone who is treated with a lot of respect, also turns out to be immoral. And then we have Helma Torvald, Nora's husband. This man is symbolic of the chauvinism in this society. That male superiority. And then Nora 
can symbolize a number of things. One, she could be symbolic of all women, in particular married women in patriarchal societies, where they are expected to be very submissive, please their husbands, dance, sing for their husbands, and they should get satisfaction from it. Two, she could also symbolize feminism. A period or a moment where women actually come out strongly to fight for what they believe is oppression, especially in patriarchal societies. So that is done uh, on symbolism. So I'll move on and look at the next aspect. So number two, we look at the contrasting meaning of the word freedom as used in uh, this text. Now what is freedom? You can think about that, the meaning of freedom. Now, basically, in a general view, we can say that freedom is basically the right that someone has to act in the way they want. So you do whatever you want. You have your own opinion. You have your own objectives, what you want your life to be, without being controlled. So someone who is free is not limited in any way. We talk about liberty. We understand what liberty uh, means there. So basically, uh, we can just say that um, our freedom in the context of a doll's house will mean that situation in which the characters are free from oppression are free from any kind of imprisonment and they are free from any kind of slavery. They can live whichever way they want. So I know the question that is on some of your minds, like, are the characters free in the text? Yeah, sure. Some are free some are in bondage. Look at women, for instance, in the text. They seem to be in a kind of bondage that they do not realize. Lack of financial freedom, being expected to sacrifice, especially for the men and the other family members, among other things. So we cannot argue that most of the characters are actually free. You know, the word free is actually relative. So now, let us look at some of the characters, or basically the characters that use the word free or freedom. So in this case here, you know, I, I quoted the word freedom. So that was deliberate. I want us to highlight that. So in relation to that, we are going to actually look at the way the writers use these two words. They will mean the same thing because one is a verb, the other one is a noun. Good, so free and freedom. Good. 
Good. So I will begin with um, Torvald. Torvald Helmer. Now, how does he look at freedom? There is a very simple fact here, and just to ensure that we actually have um, a good perspective, I will be reading uh, aspects, citations from the text uh, to ensure that uh, whatever we mention is actually uh, very clearly captured there. So now I want us to look at page, page three. Page three, Helmer says this, there can be no freedom or beauty about a home life that depends on borrowing and debt. I know, those, for those who have the text, you can underline the word freedom. So underline freedom in what I've just read there. So now, what do we understand? What is Helmer's perspective of freedom. So we realize that for Helmer, freedom means financial independence. Okay, so financial independence. What do you mean by financial independence? So financial independence here will mean the ability the ability to be self-sustainable financially. So he actually believes that for any family, there should be no borrowing of money. The family should be able to, the family should be able to spend what they have. Another character, we can look at is Krogstad. And I'll obviously read a part before we look at uh, what financial freedom is for a Krogstad. Yeah, he says this uh, in his conversation with Nora from page 35 to 36, last Krogstad, he says, the matter never came into court, but every way seemed to be closed for me after that. So I took to the business that you know of. I had to do every, something, and honestly, I don't think I've been one of the worst. But now I must cut myself free from all that. So he says he must cut himself free from all that. Now, what is this he wants to cut himself free from? Basically, the terrible reputation that he has in this society. Everyone knows him as a morally corrupt individual. We can attest this to what Dr. Rank says about him. So he wants to get his reputation back. He wants to be respected once more, and that is his notion of freedom. So to, for Krogstad, freedom means what?
his reputation in the society. Okay, another character we can look at very fast is Mrs. Lind. Now, I'll read another part before I summarize that. So we could, um, we can look at page, let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll just explain this part. We can look for that later on. In, in Mrs. Lin's conversation with Nora, she explains very well that she's so proud of herself. She worked so hard. She married a man she did not love to ensure that she took care of a, a, a sick, a bedridden mother and younger siblings. So we can argue or we can actually deduce that freedom for Mrs. Lin is almost similar to that of Helma, that financial freedom, that ability for sustainability, or a situation where someone is able to provide for their family. But then the contrast is this. When you look at Helma, Helma is looking at finances in terms of luxury, luxurious life, being able to afford everything you can and actually not be in debt. For Mrs. Lind, it's about providing the basic needs for the members of the family. She's so proud, she says, that she's happy that her mother died almost free from care. Almost free from care. And then lastly, we can look at Nora. Now, when it comes to the concept of freedom for Nora, it's actually contradicting. Nora's view of freedom at the beginning of the play is not the view she has at the end of the play. So I'll just rush through this uh, because of time there. So when we begin, the Nora's concept of freedom. Uh, let us just look at um, page 35. Page 35. She says this, I'm not afraid of you. This is in, um, in the conversation she has with Crockstead once he has come to find out uh, about the dismissal. She says, I'm not afraid of you any longer. As soon as the new year comes, I shall in a very short time be free of the whole thing. Be I shall be free from the whole thing. What does this mean? What is this thing that she wants to be free from? It is the debt. We understand that Nora had to borrow money from Crockstead, even though she does that after forging her father's name. She actually borrowed money, which she used to take the husband on a trip to Italy. And of course, the husband gets well from that. So according to Nora, freedom to her is being in a position to pay off the debts, one. And then two, doing away with any nagging individual to whom one owes money. And in this case, we are looking at Krogstad. Number two, so obviously that goes back to financial freedom there. And then number two, there is another concept on page 119 towards the end, which is the last bit I'm looking at. Nora says this on page 119. Listen, Torvald, I have heard that when a wife deserts her husband's house, 
as I am doing now. He is legally freed from all obligations towards her. So you can note the use of the word freed in that. In any case, I set you free, another word free, from all your obligations. You are not to feel yourself bound in the slightest way any more than I shall. There must be perfect freedom on both sides. This is something she mentions as she is now living in the of, uh, in the in official divorce she's now leaving the husband and the children to seek a better understanding of life and of course uh, improve on herself personality education understanding etc so she says this that she wants a situation where no one is attached to the other. She's telling the husband, Helma, that from today onwards, you are free. You're not obliged to think about me. I am not your responsibility. So in that case, you realize that her notion of freedom, in this case here, will be her independence from the husband, Helma. So as I sum up, basically, we've discussed the motive, and very importantly, I've mentioned that this is not a theme, it is not a style, but it is a situation where the writer of a text repeatedly uses a given aspect, be it an idea, a contrast, or even a stylistic device, in order to influence our understanding of the main message in the text. So I mentioned the aspects of motif, or the motifs we were interested in. One, we talked about symbolism, Two, we've talked about the contrasting meaning of the word freedom. So the others will be covered later on. Concerning the contrasting meaning of freedom, I hope you can clearly notice that in every situation, I have mentioned a character in the text. That character must have used the word free or freedom. And from that perspective, we have analyzed the meaning of the words free and freedom according to the context in which every character that has used them has obviously wanted to bring out a given communication or a given meaning. So as we come to the end of the session uh, concerning symbolism and uh, the use, the, the contrasting meaning of the word freedom uh, in the text as used by the different characters, uh, I will leave a question, an essay question that I would like you to attempt, have discussions, and then attempt. Obviously, at this point, you understand the structure of writing the essay. So this will be the question.
So there we go. It says, write an essay on how different characters in the play A Doll's House, obviously by Henrik Ibsen, use the words free and freedom. Use relevant citations from other texts. Thank you.